Thanks. Uh, sorry, I uh, we drove from Santa Barbara and we missed the morning session. I'm sorry, but uh, we are very happy to be here with my PhD students. So th the things I'm going to talk about is all done with by my PhD students who are in the audience. Can you stand up? <laughs> or wait, so that group right there. So these are their slides. I hope not to mess it up too badly. So uh, so this is about side chain analysis, and it's. An area that you could consider, I consider myself a software engineering researcher. <laughs> so, but it also relates to programming languages, relates to computer security. Uh, but we are interested looking for information link leakage in programs. But so, what is a side channel? It is the uh, great example of explaining what it is. So, this is a Time magazine article from 1990, where somebody noticed that there is some correlation between pizza orders, from Dar uh, pizza orders from Pentagon and the military actions that the United States takes. <laughs> so it turns out pizza orders just before a military, you know, big military activity, pizza orders increases in uh, Pentagon because people are staying late planning. So this is, you know, so obviously um, the press office for Pentagon is not announcing that they are going to invade some place. But uh, they have a side channel, so that's the main channel of the press office. But the side channel is the pizza orders. So without knowing that they are disclosing information, they are actually disclosing information, and somebody tracking the pizza orders can figure out when they are doing uh, action. After this article, apparently they started producing pizza, having a pizza <laughs> inside the Pentagon, so people can eat. So this is the you know, explanation of what a side channel is, but we are interested in software. So what we are interested in, do the programs, so programs take some public input and secret input, we assume, and they generate an output, but they also have some characteristics that people can observe, like execution time, memory usage, and the question is, do you leak information about the secret input, secret data, through these side channels? So the main channel is the output, but these observations we can make, like the execution time, are the side channels, and do you leak information about them? So, one well-known one is the timing side channel, execution time. So let's think about this simple uh, password checking program, which basically takes a secret string, which is the password and the input, and it compares them basically. You know, and if the input, public input, matches the password, then you're you can uh, you're authenticated and you can uh, do you know access uh, some uh, functionality. Um, let's assume that this. Uh, this is a toy example, but I'll show you that there are realistic things that are exactly based on this pattern. So this loop here, whenever it finds a mismatch between the public input and the password, it terminates. So it does early termination to optimize the code. Um, so now let's assume that each loop iteration takes one millisecond. Okay, maybe that's too large, but let's assume that there's some computation there, right? So it takes about one millisecond. So now let's see what happens when somebody enters a password. Let's say the password is vlab at UCSB, and the uh, you know, user enters xxxs. So the execution time is, let's say, five milliseconds, because there are some other instructions being executed. Now we enter a password that's alab at UCSB. Now the first character doesn't match, so the loop immediately terminates, and it still takes five milliseconds. But now I entered vxxx, so the first character matches 
So now it takes six milliseconds. So if I match the second character, then it says seven milliseconds. And you know, if I match three, it's eight milliseconds, four, nine milliseconds, and if it fully matches, 14 milliseconds. So I know how much of the prefix of the password matches to my input by observing the time. And this is called a segment oracle. There's a name for this pattern. And using this, you can actually find the figure out, automatically figure out the password. And it's much faster than doing a brute force attack where you try every string, which is going to take forever. All you have to do is here attack it one character at a time. So try all possible characters for the first character. And you know, after trying whatever ASCII characters, you will find out which what the first character is. And you go to the second character. So you are doing whatever the password si length times the alphabet size, you crack the password. So this is a very dangerous situation, right? So you don't want this. So this is the classic um, side channel. And this has been observed in different contexts, timing. Google Keys library, and people have reported vulnerabilities due to this, uh, causing you know, all sorts of trouble. So you don't want this. So um, here is another example. This is the, not password checking, it's memcompare. Mem and if you use memcompare on some secret data and compare it with some public input, you are going to leak information. And so you can't use memcompare because it does early termination again, and somebody can figure out your secret data. So what do we do? Our research has been in the last five years or so, or maybe longer than that. <laughs> it's a blur. <laughs> we develop techniques for side chain analysis. So we use symbolic execution. Uh, I assume a lot of people here know what symbolic execution is. It's a program analysis technique. But the other interesting things, we use something called model counting. It's a different kind of constraint solving technique. It's where you count the number of solutions to a constraint rather than just checking satisfiability. Uh, and then we use some side channels on top of it. Now, I will try to give you an overview of all this stuff <laughs> in the short amount of time I have, um, which is hopefully more than two minutes. <laughs> yes. So, <laughs> so um, here is the same example. It's just a little bit different. It's like four uh, digit pin, okay? And it's doing exactly the same pattern. It's doing early termination. So I can do symbolic execution on this and get the path constraints. So these are the constraints that go through different execution paths. So now, an extension to symbolic execution is probabilistic symbolic execution. Let's get those path path constraints, and let's count the number of solutions to them, and let's divide them by the domain size, OK? So this way, we can figure out the probability of each path, execution path. This is called probabilistic symbolic execution. And I'll give you the example here. Here are the path constraints. The first the first character doesn't match. That's the path constraint for that. And the probability of that is going to be pretty good. It's actually 0 0.5. You know, because, OK, I'm assuming binary. Sorry, this is a very simple example. I'm just assuming binary variables, all right? It's a bit array, basically, of size 4. The second one, the first one matches. The second doesn't match. That's 0 0.25 probability. And we can just get these probabilities by counting the number of solutions to constraints and divided it by, dividing it by the domain size, assuming uniform distribution of input and the signal. All right? So I can do this probabilistic symbolic execution and figure out these probabilities. So now you may say, OK, so what? Why, do you, why are you interested in the probabilities? For the following reason, because I want to do side channel analysis. So I want to quantify information leakage. So how do we do that? So maybe you took an information theory course and you already know the answer. But <laughs> The answer is, one answer is Shannon entropy. It is the magic formula of Shannon entropy, which is the expected value of log 1 over the probability. Now, you may say, what is the meaning of that formula? It is expected value of information gain. So it's an expected value, so it's a weighted sum over the probability. And this information gain expressed in terms of bits. That's why we have a log there. And this is a helpful measure of information gain, right? People use this. Now, if you are still confused about this, I'll give you the, our favorite example, entropy example. Seattle weather in December. It always rains. So <laughs> the probability of rain is 1, sun is 0. You go outside and look at the weather. How much information do you gain? 0, because it's always raining. So entropy formula will tell you it's 0. Now, 
San Francisco weather in December, coin flip. Half of the time it rains, half of the time it doesn't rain. How much information you gain when you look at the weather? One bit. It's either, you know, it's a coin flip, so you get one bit of information. Now, Santa Barbara, it's almost always nice. 90% <laughs> sun, maybe 10% rain. So now, what is the number for that? How much information you gain by looking at the weather? Because mostly it's sunny, right? But you still gain some information, and Shannon Entropy will tell you this many bits. So it tells you a way of quantifying information here, right? So this is, so we apply this to program analysis. So getting back to side channel analysis, we get path constraints. We associate timing observations with them statically. This is an estimate of how much time each execution path takes. And we use actually the number of instructions executed. From this, we can compute the probability as I said, using model counting, put them together, we can actually tell you your leaky password checker leaks 1.8 bits of information, 1.9 approximately, whereas if you fix it and you don't use early termination, it actually leaks less, 0.3. So this is a way to quantify information leakage in software. So we apply this, implemented this for Java programs, and actually we can compute this. Now, there is a magic hammer here, <laughs> like the model counting constraint solver. How do you do that? Well, we use something called automata-based model counting. Uh, we take the constraints. To count the number of solutions, we construct an automaton characterizing the accepting uh, solutions, accepting the solutions to that constraint. So we construct an automaton. And uh, we'll have a poster on that. <laughs> uh, and then, here is an example of that. And then this reduces model counting to path counting. So now all I have to do is the count the number of accepting paths in the automaton. Right? So that's the um, thing you need to do. So how do you solve that? You ask Bill Hunting. Do you, you, you remember the movie, Bill Hunting? He's a MIT janitor, and then there's a problem on the blackboard. The problem is path counting problem. And he solves it. The solution is right there. <laughs> So I don't have time to go over the solution, but this is how you do the path counting. You can do matrix exponentiation, or you can use generating functions. So we implemented this stuff using uh, looking at the blackboard there. <laughs> and so we have an implementation that does actual model counting automata. Now, how many minutes do I have? Uh, still have five minutes. Awesome. OK. So now the last phase. So we put all this together, and the next thing we said, and this is Lucas Pang's dissertation, actually, um, and Shimanto had an extension. <laughs> so um, how can we generate inputs to steal the secret? By the way, at this point, we got a little bit nervous when we were doing it. You know, hey, this is an offensive technique, so now we are actually really developing techniques to steal secrets. One thing, it's not that scalable yet, so we are not worried about, <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, application to large-scale software at this point. But we are working on scaling it, so it's improving. At the se second thing, we are not targeting crypto code yet. But I also think that if we succeed too much, you know, NSA is going to tell us to stop doing research on this. But at the same time, we are not interested in offensive techniques. We are interested in defensive techniques. But we need to see the vulnerability. What is the possible attack so we can defend against it, right? So that is the goal. But we want to see if this is doable. So what are the public inputs? the shortest way to get the secret. So this is the problem we investigated. At the very core of it, I can't give you all the technical details, is, but it's something like this. So we have a secret domain, and we have a public input that we provide. And when we provide this public, public input, we make an observation. And in the very simple case, this observation divides the secret domain to two. Right? Let's, let's say the very basic case. Now, you may, answer, you may wonder, what is the input what is the best way to divide the secret domain? So if you are going to divide the secret domain to two, and you want to get the maximum amount of information, anybody wants to uh, suggest something like, what's the best way to divide it? Randomly. Randomly is not good. That doesn't give you, I mean, it depends on what you're optimizing. <laughs> OK, Lucas, what's the answer? Divided in half. Divided in half. Because there is an algorithm we know binary search. So if you want to get the secret as fast as possible, if you divide in half in logarithmic time, you'll get the secret. 
And the thing is, but this is just for binary search. What is the general principle? If you balance the partition, you get the maximum information gain. And actually, this is maximum information gain leads to binary search. Binary search is an instance of a more general idea, which is maximizing the information gain. So we can do this. This is the predicate for binary search. We can do this for any kind of predicate. So maximizing the information gain. And actually, it comes from shared entropy. So binary search is actually, a, you know, you can infer binary search from the uh, Shannon entropy formula. So we implemented this. Uh, we have some um, heuristics to maximize the information gain. This is, there are a lot of steps of this which is, um, have high complexity. So we don't get the actual the optimum attack, but we can reuse heuristics to get as short an attack as possible. Here is some implementation from a paper a year ago. Uh, I won't go over the details, but just to show you that we did implement this stuff. And we experimented on some uh, Java functions, and we synthesized attacks. And in some cases, for example, uh, we show that the, we find when it, the final entropy is zero, we, that means that we completely found the secrets. And sometimes we, can all, we have a bunch of heuristics, and they can all find the secrets. And sometimes some can find, and some cannot find. So there is a bunch of um, you know, heuristics we experimented on. Now I want to give you the overall picture before I conclude. So the overall picture, picture, picture is that we use symbolic execution, we use uh, model counting, and we use entropy. Uh, and combining all this together, we can detect side channels, quantify the amount of leakage, and actually also find the attacks that uh, you know, find the secret. Uh, we have a, a lot of papers on this. <laughs> But uh, different aspects of it, because there's the model counting aspect, there's the you know, attack synthesis, there's quantification. So we did a bunch of work. And again, as I said, um, it's the work of my students. So conclusions, model counting enables quantitative program analysis. We can detect side channels using probabilistic symbolic execution. And we can synthesize ad adaptive attacks automatically using symbolic execution and model counting. Thanks. So you already told us uh, it doesn't scale very well. Um, can you give us some more insights as to? Yeah. <coughs> so, so currently, I think if you have a function, you give us a Java function, I don't know how many lines. <laughs> like, uh, 100, 200 lines. Uh, yeah, we could do that. We could synthesize attacks. Uh, not interprocedural, intraprocedural. So, you know. Um, we have techniques that scales to thousands of lines of code without using symbolic execution doing profiling. So my student Brock, for example, works on a tool that does network traffic profiling. It's a different approach. It's not based on symbolic execution. You can still use entropy. Um, more scalable techniques are fuzzing based. So yeah. Um, but the fuzzing based techniques cannot, are not sound. So we can develop sound uh, analysis using symbolic execution based. I think it's going to be a combination. I think we, for example, I mean, we literally got order of magnitude improvement by caching constraints. So that's a recent work we submitted. So I think there's a lot of room for growth. So, and model counting is also improving. So model counting constraint solvers nowadays are where SMT was 20 years ago, mm -hmm. okay? So I don't know how fast it's going to uh, develop, but any improvement there, yeah, I mean, if. Again, when I was doing my PhD, if you told people I send, take my program and send it to a SAT solver for bug checking, people would laugh at you. But now, you know, everybody's doing it. So it's scalability of model counting is key. So if we get improvement there, um, yeah, then it will be more and more scalable. That model counting is bounded though, right? So, no, model counting, to model count you give a bound. Mm -hmm. Our model counter is not bounded. Okay. It's parameterized. So we generate a model counting function you give as an input a bound, and it gives you the answer. But we don't pre-put a bound before we do it. Right. So uh, I have another question. Yep. So you went through the, the table with the evaluation results yeah. uh, pretty quickly. Yes, um, there, I know. So you, there was some part there, again, yeah. about yeah. Uh, model-based attacks, meta-heuristic yeah. techniques. Uh, so what are you doing with the heuristic techniques? Yeah, so you know I said we optimize the function. Yeah. So this one using symbolic exit as simulated anonym. This one using genetic algorithms. Mm -hmm. This one uses random. Oh. And this one actually doesn't optimize at all. Oh. 
And so these ones that optimize actually reduce the number of attack steps. So you get to the same leakage earlier. So you are trying to minimize the number of attack steps. Whereas model-based is faster because it's trying, not trying to optimize, but the attack takes longer. So attack preparation time is fast, but attack itself is longer. Whereas if you optimize, attack preparation is longer, but attack itself is shorter. So uh, we can take one more question while the new steps up. So Manu Sridharan is an associate professor at the University of California, Riverside, who works on um, programming languages and software engineering, applying techniques like static analysis, dynamic analysis, and program synthesis for a variety of applications, including security and software quality. Uh, he's um, He's worked at places like IBM Research, Samsung Research, Uber, which also means his research has been incorporated into real commercial tools at these major companies. And um, so uh, with that introduction, uh, let's let Manu take the floor. <coughs> All right, thanks. Uh, can people hear me? Yeah? Cool. OK. Um, thanks a lot. I'm really happy uh, to be speaking here today and hearing about all the exciting work. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about some work that uh, I started while I was at Uber, and I'm continuing to, to research now that I'm at Riverside. Uh, and basically, it's about uh, <coughs> new applications and new techniques for deploying pluggable types. So let me start by giving some background. So what are pluggable types? Uh, at a high level, they're a way to extend your compiler to do additional type checking for properties that aren't so easily expressed in the language's type system. And often this is done uh, via extra annotations, type annotations in the code. So the pioneering uh, paper in this space uh, was published at ISTA 2008. It got the 10-year test of time award uh, last year. And the best known work is embodied uh, in this system called the Checker Framework from Mike Ernst and his group at Washington. So let me illustrate this uh, with an example, uh, which is around nullability in Java, right? So when you compile your Java code, it doesn't guarantee that you won't have a null pointer exception when you try to run the code. So you can use a pluggable type system to add that guarantee to the compiler. So here's a very simple example. We have this log function that prints two string of its parameter. And here we're calling it with null in this foo function, right? So this is bad. This is going to cause a null pointer exception. So the way that works with pluggable types is that the baseline assumption is that any function parameter, unless annotated otherwise, can't be null, OK? So immediately with this code, you're going to get an error because the assumption is that log cannot take null values and you're trying to pass it null right here. Okay? So if you want a function to be able to take null values, you can add one of these type annotations. Right? So here we're saying, okay, log actually can accept null values. But now we have another problem right? because now the tool knows that x can be null and we're dereferencing it when we do this method call. So to really fix this code, you can add a null check, which the tool understands and it can say, fine, uh, this code is safe. You're not going to have a null pointer exception. Uh, so this is all great, but uh, what's new, right? <laughs> this paper was published in 2008. There's been a ton of work here. Well, um, I think it's worth taking another look at the practicality of this approach. And to kind of discuss that, I'm going to make a vastly oversimplifying characterization of different types of bug finding techniques and their kind of trade-offs. Uh, so static analysis. You take a bunch of code, uh, you don't need to annotate it, and we try to analyze it and find bugs. So this is great because you can cover kind of all the different paths through this code, but it has some disadvantages, right? So you do get false positives. These can cause a lot of problems. Uh, you get clear error messages sometimes, but a lot of times, no. You can see this great CACM paper uh, by the folks behind the Covariate tools for uh, discussions of the trade-offs of deploying analyses when developers can't understand the errors. And also the overhead uh, of running a whole program static analysis can be quite high. So on the flip side, we have dynamic analysis. Uh, here, we don't have the false positive problem, right? Because we've observed a behavior inside an execution of a program. 
You also don't need annotations here. But again, there's problems. Now you need to actually cover the relevant behaviors to see the problem, right? You need test inputs to expose the problem, so it's not covering all the paths. Again, you can have issues with errors, like data races. If you look at the errors you get from some of these tools, it can actually be quite complicated to understand what's going on. Uh, and again, overhead can be high. In practice, it's also kind of difficult to deploy these tools sometimes, like if you're testing a mobile app to get the instrumentation, to get the results out. So what about pluggable types? Uh, I would argue it hits an interesting different space here, right, where you do cover all the paths. Uh, we do get false positives, right? It's a static technique, so it can't be perfect. But I would argue that because you have a type system, it's more understandable what's going on, and you can insert downcasts in an understandable way to mitigate the issues. Uh, similarly, with the error messages, again, if you have an understandable type system, and you're not trying to do very sophisticated global inference, I would argue the errors from these systems are much more understandable. Uh, and the overhead uh, can be quite low. So I put a question mark there because that's kind of part of the work that we did. So the big problem is this giant yes. Uh, you need annotations, right? And I think for the longest time, the assumption in the community is that, oh, come on, developers are never going to write annotations, right? It's a bunch of extra work. Uh, you can't make them do it. They just want to ship their, their features. Well, I think things are, are changing here. And I think one of the main game changers, at least from my experience at Uber, are mobile apps and mobile app crashes. So, you know, some of us remember the day when, you know, you got your software on a pile of like 40 CDs. Uh, but nowadays, um, it's actually a big problem that with a mobile app bug, if you have an app that's crashing in the field, it can take days to weeks to get the fix out to your user. And this is seen as actually a really long time, right? Particularly for a business critical application, compared to say code running on a back end server, where once you have the fix, if you have a good continuous deployment story, you can get your fix out in minutes to hours. So because uh, of you know, these app crashes becoming kind of business critical, uh, developers are much more willing to put some work in ahead of time to prevent these crashes from happening uh, in the field. So they are willing to annotate their code more. And you see this in the enthusiasm for languages uh, like Swift on iOS and Kotlin on Android, which actually bake things like null safety uh, right into the languages type system. Another cool thing about pluggable types here, I think, is that they enable a development methodology where you have a green master. So what I mean is that if I check out the master branch of my code, it should have no warnings at all and that you can actually block commits from landing if they have any warnings. So you can do this because you can run these type checks inside uh, the compiler on every single build. And if they're low enough overhead uh, and they're understandable, you can, you can make this work. We have made this work. And I would argue this is much harder to do with static analysis due to understandability of errors and how long it can take to run. So there are some key challenges in making you know, pluggable types work for real. Can you get the overhead low enough so that you can get feedback to developers very quickly? Uh, and can you get the false positive rate low enough that it's tolerable and it's sort of seen as a win for the developers? So I'm going to talk about uh, some of the experience that we had at Uber uh, deploying pluggable type systems that actually do run on every single build of, of say, the mobile application code. Uh, so I'm going to talk about NullAway, which is a more practical uh, type-based null safety system. And if I have time, I'll also talk about uh, pluggable types for safer stream-based multi-threading. And finally, I'll conclude by talking a little bit about future work. So let's start with NullAway. So I basically showed you um, in my example how these uh, type-based null safety systems work. The, the core functionality of NullAway uh, is no different, basically, than that example that I showed you. So uh, Uber needed null safety for Android. Null pointer exceptions were a huge crash, huge cause of crashes uh, in the Uber Android apps. So they tried a tool called Eradicate. This is a tool that's part of Facebook Infer. Uh, if you're familiar with that, it's a static analysis system from Facebook for finding bugs. Uh, and Eradicate is kind of a type-based approach to null safety. Uh, and it worked pretty well, I would say, uh, in that you know, they deployed it. It caught many bugs before they shipped. But there were some problems. So first, it was, it was too slow still. So it was too slow to run on developers' local builds. So instead, it only ran as part of continuous integration. And this led to a bad developer experience, right? Because um, 
due to machine resources, the way the workflow worked is you would put up your diff, you'd go through code review, everything was fine, and then maybe an hour later, you get back this message, sorry, uh, you can't land your change. There's a null pointer bug. And you know, you might be in, in the middle of something else at this point, and it's just not a great workflow. Uh, and also, it caught many bugs, but it was still missing a few. There were some soundness issues that were actually you know, leaving crashes there in the field. So then, uh, we also tried the checker framework. And you know, still a performance issue with overhead. It was too slow. And checker framework kind of had the opposite problem, that uh, it, it tries to be sound. Uh, but this led to too many false positive warnings uh, uh, for developers to find this usable. So we set out to, to set a system that was fast, that could catch most or nearly all of the bugs we saw in production, and with a low false positive rate. So there were two key techniques that we used to achieve this. So in terms of soundness, we were kind of aiming for trade-offs here, right? Our goal was, and this is kind of a mouthful, but I'll try to explain it, we wanted no false positives, no false negatives in practice for checked code, right? So you've got code that Uber developers wrote, and you have code inside third-party libraries. And we call the code that we're actually checking the checked code, and we don't want to, we're gonna make some unsound assumptions, but we don't want those to lead to crashes, as far as we can observe, based on the crash data that's coming back from the field. So there's a variety of techniques in these space, sort of carefully tuned unsound assumptions. I don't have time to get into the detail. I'll illustrate an example uh, on the next slide, though. Uh, for unchecked libraries, for third-party libraries, here our only choice, uh, the practical should have time, was to handle them optimistically. So this means if you're calling a third-party library, let's assume that it's fine to pass null in there. Let's assume that it's never going to return null back to you. Um, sort of a sound pessimistic treatment of these libraries just had an impractical uh, annotation burden. There's, there's no way we could make it work. And this does still lead to misbugs, and this is kind of part of the future work I'm going to talk about. So in terms of these unsound assumptions, um, so we're unsound for side effects. Let's look at uh, uh, this code example. So we have some type that's a foo holder with a field foo, and now we have a null check on that field. And then down here, we dereference it right in the last line, but in the middle, we call this setter method and actually set it to null. Okay, so this is bad code, and since null away assumes that methods don't have side effects, it'll actually miss this problem. But the thing is, this is extremely rare in practice. In fact, I can't recall a single null pointer crash from the field that was actually caused after null away was running that was actually caused by something like this. So, this is the kind of thing we're talking about trying to pick and choose these uh, unsound assumptions so they have absolutely minimal impact based on what we observed. So in terms of overhead, what we did was we built the system directly as a plugin to, to the Java compiler. In particular, we were using uh, the error-prone framework from Google, which makes it easy to build these plugins. We leveraged a library from the checker framework for doing data flow analysis, but we didn't integrate this as, any, as part of any other sort of broad framework for type checking like is done in the checker framework. So I think that removed a lot of overhead since it was all very targeted to null checking. Uh, and then we used sort of standard smart implementation techniques, right? We tried to be lazy and only run expensive data flow analysis when it was required. And we tried to sort of aggressively cache uh, the results that we got so we wouldn't be doing redundant work. So in terms of our results, the overhead was, was quite low compared to previous systems. So it's about 15% slow down on a compile, and this is compared to say 2.7x for eradicate or 5.9x on average for the checker framework. So this is low enough that you can just run this on every single build, and in fact, that's, that's what's done uh, at Uber. And in terms of, uh, of, of, of sort of soundness, how many bugs are we letting through? Uh, we looked at 30 days of crash data, and because of, we, we did have null pointer exceptions, what none of them were due to our unsound assumptions for the checked code, things like assuming no side effects or assuming purity. Uh, the remaining causes, the biggest one is still libraries, third-party libraries. Uh, but then there was stuff like uh, developers suppressed a warning incorrectly or reflection. But none of them were due to sort of these language level unsound assumptions that we made. And this kind of held up across open source benchmarks that we looked at too. We looked at 18 open source benchmarks. And we looked at the additional warnings given by the checker framework that we didn't report. And uh, none of them were actually true positives. So 
There's no guarantees. It could be that in different domains, like Nullaway will perform horribly, but at the apps we looked at, it seems to do a pretty good job of catching the real bugs. So this is open source. Uh, please try it out if you're writing Java code. Uh, it's a pretty popular project, and I think uh, hopefully it would work well for you also. So let me talk briefly, if I have time. I'm doing okay? Yeah, okay. So four minutes. Okay, so let me talk briefly uh, about this other project we did around uh, stream-based multi-threading. So we all know that you know, multi-threading bugs are, are really bad, right? Because they're not deterministic, so they're hard to test for, uh, they're hard to reproduce. Uh, data races are kind of a classic example here of a bad bug. On mobile and on other UI frameworks as well, there's this uh, other class of bugs where there's a distinguished main thread or a UI thread. And if you try to actually do user interface operations and you're not on that thread, that can cause a crash or can corrupt data structures. This is actually a pretty bad, bad bug on Android because it often leads to a crash. Traditionally, you know, multi-threading bugs are very hard to catch with static analysis at a large scale, right? Because it's hard to reason about unstructured parallelism, right? Where any code can just spawn a thread whenever it wants. You need a very precise alias analysis to be able to handle this without a high false positive rate. The thing uh, at Uber and in a lot more um, mobile applications in general, I think we saw some stuff from Apple about this kind of framework uh, this week, is that they, they, they often are programming using these stream abstractions. Uh, for dealing with network results, for dealing with I.O. on the screen. And this is an example of how you do multi-threading. So you have these streams of values, which are called uh, observables in this ReactiveX framework. Uh, and then if you have to do some expensive computation, you have this call uh, observe on computation, which basically says, you know, run the subsequent operations on a background thread. So now I can do my expensive computation but before I display my results, I need to observe on the main thread again. So move the computation back to the main thread so I can actually display the result uh, on the correct thread. So notice that this is very highly structured, right? There's no random spawning of threads. There's no complex aliasing involved. And so we saw an opportunity, again, to use pluggable types to make sure that you're doing this kind of stuff correctly. So we built a pluggable type system around this. And the key idea is, are we have thread types, which basically tell you uh, for a particular stream uh, what thread group is it running on. So is it running on the main UI thread? Is it running on a compute thread and so on? And then we had to write down type signatures for all these operations on streams, right? So we had this observe on operation which switches the thread. And here the idea is that we associate a type with the thread ID and that becomes the new type of the result stream, right? The result observable. Uh, but for a function like map, and for most functions, uh, they don't do anything to the thread. So you just say that whatever type T1, the observable thread was on initially, that's the same type at the end, right? This is standard sort of parametric polymorphism from type systems. And we can use checker frameworks type inference to magically solve all these constraints for us. So let me just quickly walk you through a buggy example. So here, it's the same example as before, except I removed the observe on main, right? So this final thing is gonna do an off main thread UI access. So the way that this works is, first we need to know which methods are touching the UI, right? So for that, we have annotations. Uh, this display method will have an annotation. We'll infer it for this lambda. And in general, we have an effect analysis to make sure you've written these annotations correctly. This is from previous work by Colin Gordon and collaborators. So now we have to bring in our thread types. So let's say that this started on the main thread. After you do this observe on, we're going to be on a compute thread. And this map operation doesn't affect the thread. So we're still on a compute thread. So now we've got an error, right? We know that we have a stream that's on a compute thread and we have this callback which is touching the UI. So we can statically report that you've got a UI off the main thread bug. So uh, our results with this system, we tested it on some open source applications and you know this stuff doesn't come for free, right? So on average, it took a couple of hours to introduce the annotations required. I'm done? Okay. You can sit. Yeah. yeah, so, but briefly, um, this, this runs at Uber and it's, it, we think it catches uh, a, a lot of bugs and prevents them. So future work, uh, we want to try to solve this inference problem, right? The thing with the third party libraries, two hours per app. I think we have some cool ideas on how to reduce that dramatically. 
And also, we're working on some new type systems for checking things like complex object construction protocols and other issues with streams. So sorry for going over, but thanks, and I'm happy to answer questions if we have time. So uh, maybe one or two questions. Do you worry about um, bugs in the type inference rules? Like, or is that not a concern? Like, because you have a type checker, but then you have type inference rules. Do you mm -hmm. get bugs in that? Do they get complicated enough that you may have bugs in your type inference? It's pretty standard. It's, you know, we're not doing any fancy new type inference. It's stuff that's been well understood. But yeah, there always, there always could be a bug. We definitely had bugs just in our tool. Yeah. Uh, you know. I mean, and especially so we, with concurrency, I was wondering. It could be tricky with the concurrency. Uh, but, uh, you know. Yeah, I think actually where we've also seen bugs is in, sorry, in, in writing these type signatures. Yeah, exactly. Actually, sometimes the documentation is lacking. Right. And some operation will stick you on a background thread, and it's not even there in the documentation. So you discover, hey, this bug happened. How is this possible? And you go look at the implementation. Right. And that's when you realize that it can switch the thread on you. Yeah. So that's actually somewhat tricky, is someone has to write these by yeah. hand and get them correct. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Sure. Do you, do you see an opportunity to learn those type annotations from the existing annotations you have already written in other, um, maybe the same code base or other code base? Yeah, I think, yeah. So I'm, I, I mentioned doing better inference. Uh, I'm very interested in that. And I think, you know, either by analyzing the implementation, or that's a good idea, looking at existing usages, uh, there's a good chance we could do a better job of automatically inferring these kind of signatures. Yeah, that's a nice idea. Okay, so uh, let's thank uh, Manu one more time. So our next speaker is Nino Medvedevich. He's a professor at the Computer Science Department uh, and for the Informatics Program at the University of Southern California. Uh, he's been, for instance, director of the USC Center for Systems and Software Engineering. So if you remember at the beginning, uh, they used to be uh, co-founders, I guess, of, of what was the precursor to this, the California uh, Software Symposium. Uh, he's been a chair of a variety of software engineering committees, uh, including uh, SIGSOF. Uh, he's been a PC chair at ICSI 2011. He's had several most influential and best paper awards at top conferences and most cited recognitions from journals. He's an ACM Distinguished Scientist and IEEE Fellow. Um, and so, all right, and I think uh, he's about ready to speak. Um, so, you know, whenever you're ready, go ahead. All right. Thank you, Josh. Hooked up here. Can you guys hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So, um, I first want to uh, say how happy I am that there are so many friendly faces in the crowd. I got my PhD here, under Dick Taylor, in fact. Uh, it always feels like coming back home when I come here. Um, I also want to thank uh, Manu for a really interesting talk. Um, that's the only one I caught, because the, the uh, organizers were nice enough to reschedule my talk for the afternoon, because I uh, was traveling and my schedule was a little bit out of control. So um, before I go on to my talk, I just want to ask Manu, with all these fancy uh, static analysis-based solutions, how it is that Uber can tell me they're five minutes away, and three minutes later they tell me they're seven minutes away. <laughs> just, but, we, need the, um, we need the timing analysis. You don't, you don't have to answer that right now. It's just, uh, just wondering. All right. So um, I'm going to talk to you about uh, mining architectural information to um, stem technical debt. And um, basically, I'll start with a variation of a slide that some of you have seen before. You go on Google. Uh, you type software architecture, you go to images, and then you get a bunch of beautiful architectures. Everybody uh, brags about how awesome their architecture is. Um, and for anybody who knows anything about software and how it's built and what happens with it over time, they know that this is uh, a pipe dream. It doesn't really work like that. So then one question you might ask yourself is, why do we constantly do this? Why do we lie to ourselves and to others, right? Um, so the fact that... Um, a software systems architecture exists in two guises is kind of the, the underlying factor in uh, everything that I do 
in uh, this thread of my research. Basically, at every point in time, you have two different architectures for your system. Uh, one of them is what you're thinking of as your architecture, the, the pretty pictures that you may draw, and the other one is what gets built. And in fact, very often, the person who does this in their mind might not be the same person as the people who are building it. They might help along, they might build a part of the system. There could be lots of developers. And then, of course, there are lots of patches and hacks and so on that find their way into the system. So now you have this PA, the prescriptive architecture, and the DA, the descriptive architecture, and they can start diverging from one another. So this is an example that um, came out of some of the research that Josh Garcia did several years ago. Um, I was looking for kind of a cool illustrative example, so I decided to go with this one. We have some more uh, recent stuff that I'll talk to you about as well. This is from Hadoop um, with the help of Owen, in fact, who is here, who at the time was at Yahoo and was working on Hadoop's architecture. We basically looked at the Hadoop distributed file system, found a bunch of documentation for it, saw pictures like this, and then went through the process of extracting from the code what that architecture actually, the, the descriptive architecture, would look like. So with some um, help from, from Owen, after a few iterations, we realized that the descriptive architecture looked like this. And then we added uh, MapReduce, and then we also added all of the utility <laughs> classes of Hadoop. And this was the architecture that we arrived at after uh, quite a few weeks, if not months. Uh, just another view of this. This is the same, same view, just distributed uh, along a circle. There are 67 components, and I'll come back to this view in uh, just a second. So what happened here? Well, what we see is architectural decay. Two different phenomena, drift and erosion. This was stuff that was recognized by uh, Dwayne Perry and Alex Wolf when they first, in the early 1990s, published kind of the, the uh, foundational paper on software architecture, where they talked about things that happen in real systems where a system will diverge from its original plans, its, its original prescriptive architecture, either because you're just coming up with stuff that has nothing to do with what you originally thought of and planned, or you're directly invalidating things that you uh, decided was going to uh, hold true of, of your system. Um, and both of these are uh, manifestations of uh, technical debt. So uh, the way we wanted to approach this problem of technical debt is we wanted to see whether we can take ideas that come out of uh, people who are looking at source code and how uh, software systems are implemented and uh, basically draw the parallel to high-level design architecture, the kind of the, the load-bearing walls of your system. So uh, technical debt stinks. It stinks in the, at the level of code. It also stinks at the level of, of uh, design. So what we came up with was an original uh, set of four architectural smells. That's when Josh was uh, still at, at USC uh, before he moved on to greener pastures. But then since then, we've actually expanded this catalog quite a bit. Uh, these are commonly made design decisions, so silly things that you tend to do or people you know tend to do, uh, and they will negatively impact your system's life cycle properties. So they'll make your system brittle, they'll make it difficult to maintain, they might make it more difficult to test. The problem with these, uh, at least until some of the recent research that my group uh, has done, was that it was really difficult to convince skeptics that this is the case. So typically if you were to preach to the choir, people who believe that architecture is important, they nod their heads. But then if there is like one half of the room believes and the other half doesn't, the people who think that, yeah, it's fine, we can just, you know, we'll, we'll be careful about how we build our systems. We know what we're doing. We have really good frameworks, right? Um, so all of that stuff is going to work great. Nah, I don't buy this. It actually turns out that uh, you should buy it, and I'll, I'll provide some evidence for that. So the problem that we were facing, not just my group, but anybody else who is kind of working in this area of software architecture and, and uh, architectural decay is that these things are not bugs. These things manifest themselves in sometimes in subtle ways. Sometimes you pay the price a year later for something silly you did today, right? Uh, so they don't break the system. Typically, software engineers, software engineering researchers really like to work on problems that break the system now because those are, you know, very easily spotted and in a sense, no, um, uh, intent here of disparaging anybody's research because every, everything you heard today uh, is uh, very relevant, in some ways possibly more relevant than this, but that's kind of the equivalent of doing research under the lamppost. This is where, you know, this is, this, this is the direct pain point, so we're just going to address this. Well, the causes might have been somewhere else. 
So uh, we came up with this catalog over time of architectural smells pertaining to a system's interface, um, the dependencies in the system, uh, the changes in the system over time, uh, and uh, the concerns that the system might, might cover. I'm not going to take you through all of these. I'll show you just a couple of examples. So here's an example of uh, a smell. This is a um, schematic of a dependency cycle. A depends on B, B depends on C, C depends on A. It happens all the time. Um, you could have a component that is talking to a bunch of other components in the system. Yeah, the system works still, but every time you have to do any kind of uh, modification to the system and you have to maintain it, these kinds of things can cause trouble. Uh, you could have scattered parasitic functionality. So you have a concern that you're trying to solve uh, in your system. You're trying to implement something to deal with it. And you have a part of that concern implemented in one component, and you have other parts kind of distributed across other components. So the next time you have to maintain anything pertaining to this, you might actually have to hunt through your system for places where these kinds of things are located. So all of the smells that we have identified so far, and we have uh, 12 of them uh, formally defined and have algorithms for detecting them in a, in a design um, uh, manifestation or design kind of um, uh, extracted from your system's implementation, which I'll talk about in just a second, all of them have these kinds of, uh, these kinds of schematics associated with them. So what happened in Hadoop? To go back to that example that I talked about a minute ago, 67 components nicely distributed across this uh, gigantic polygon. Uh, 66, actually, there's a 67th uh, component at the very top. Um, so one of the things that we spotted was that 61 out of those 67 components engaged in one gigantic uh, dependency cycle, okay? And it was one of those things where it took a while to confirm that, you know, we're not going crazy or anything. You had to read a lot of code, and in the end, yeah, it actually did um, have this one big dependency cycle. So almost everything in the system is involved in this thing, potentially uh, cascading any changes you might need to make to any one of those components to... 60 other components in your system, 90% uh, or so of your system. Uh, lots of component use overload examples. So uh, this is something called name node, and name node had lots of things going in, lots of things coming out. Um, MapReduce client, uh, this one was interesting also because it was a client, and yet lots of things are calling into it. So it also begged the question, why is it a client? A client typically calls out. You're not supposed to call into a client, but you know, um, Hadoop works. We I use can it every day. Answer that if you want. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, concern overload. Uh, components that look like what to us should be connectors, or maybe connectors that look like what to us should be components. So a component doing a bunch of different, or a module doing a bunch of different things that we couldn't quite classify properly, and so on. So. Why do you care? Well, it turns out, so this is older stuff, and several of you have seen this before, but why should you care? Well, because of what I'm going to show you right now. It turns out you should care because this actually implements your system's implementation, or rather affects your system's implementation. Smelly files, so files that are involved with, with one, of, one or more of these uh, architectural smells, they're more issue prone. So if you go through your system's issue repository and correlate the issues with specific places in your system where they have occurred and look at how the issues have been fixed uh, and what has been affected, in other words, what, what had to be touched to fix to address that issue, it turns out that smelly files are more issue prone. So here, the thing that I, I isolated there, basically they, these are pairs of bars. Um, one of them on the left, for each, each pair on the left you have the smelly one and on the right you have the clean one. So you'll see that in every instance, you don't have to worry about what these systems are. I'll come back to them in a minute. These are large uh, open source Apache systems. But in every is instance, um, the smelly file is significantly more issue prone than the clean file. Also, they tend to be more change prone. So in every single instance, if you have a smell, and that smell actually originates by some set of design decisions that were propagated, maybe unknowingly, into implementation decisions, eventually you'll end up having to change those files a lot more than the files that were actually kind of nicely uh, implemented, their designs were respected, uh, preserved over time, and so on. So how do we know? We know because of this uh, tool, uh, or rather workbench that we've built over time called Arcade. Arcade allows us to automatically suck in lots of source code from many different system versions, and also um, 
uh, information from different issue repositories, uh, slice and dice them, I'm not going to get into the details of that, and then correlate uh, them uh, with, with one another. So we, in the end, we start with the source code and issue repositories, and we'll look at the correlation data and try to figure out uh, to what extent architecture actually matters. And one of the things that we do from source code is we actually recover your system's architecture. And for that, there are automated techniques. I'm not here to defend any one of those techniques. Each one of them has certain issues associated with them. The ones that we are using are static analysis uh, based. But we've actually done a couple of things. We've done a large empirical study looking at their accuracy. And then also we have looked at each one of those techniques uses different uh, types of algorithms. We've looked at actually whether we get qualitatively different results by applying different techniques. And it turns out that we don't. And I'll show you some um, data for that as well. So we wanted to uh, find out uh, in what ways architectures change and when, um, when and how they decay. And then what's the relationship between architectural smells and implementation issues? So if I have this half of the room and they all go, well, we use really powerful frameworks and we have fantastic engineers, we don't care about your architecture stuff. We don't believe in that. And this room goes, um, you know, these people are driving me crazy because for two decades, three decades now, we've been telling them you need to be careful about this stuff. But we can't make you listen, right? Well, one way to make you listen is to actually look at this. Because implementation issues, those are the things that you have to address in the code. They could be bugs, they could be performance issues, they could be uh, any range of things, right? So if I can show you that the architectural decisions that you make, or the architectural decisions that you break, uh, impact your system's implementation, well, maybe you'll listen to me. So um, we did this with a whole bunch of systems. This is a subset of them. Uh, within the last couple of years, we actually did this with the Android framework. And I'll show you some data for Android itself, just because it seemed like an interesting thing to do. Uh, these are uh, open source systems. We've done this on two closed source systems, um, proprietary <coughs> systems, that I can't really tell you about today. So we'll just focus on the open source stuff. Um, basically, what we assumed was that generally there are some deviations from this, but you will basically have the versioning scheme of major minor patch. Uh, and uh, major basically involves things like API changes, minor uh, typically backward compatible features, and patches are no API changes allowed, just bug fixes, uh, tweaks like, like that. Uh, so what we wanted to look at uh, were things like, let me see, since I don't have a pointer, uh, things like what happens between two minor changes, what happens between two major changes, what happens between patches, and then what happens when you go from a minor change to the next major change. In other words, one question that I have had, and I still don't have a, don't have a very good answer, is how do software engineers decide that 3.6.4 is going to be the last 3.6 version for this system. We're going to go over to 4.0, right? What's the magic? You know, how do you, how do you decide that? So this seemed like it should be a momentous jump. So we also wanted to, to study that. So uh, what we found was that architectures change. Uh, they change mostly uh, between major changes or major versions, I should say. But they also change a lot between uh, like the last non-major version and the next major version. So your 3.8, you jump to 4.0. That's a significant architectural change. There are some changes uh, in the cases of minor versions and patches, uh, but they're typically smaller. Sometimes minor versions actually result in significant uh, architectural changes in your system as well. Um, more interesting perhaps, because uh, I don't think any of you have seen this, we've looked at uh, Android 6, 7, and 8. And uh, these are some of the differences between Android 6 and 7. What you see on the outer edge are all of the components recovered from the Android architecture. Um, I think this was done uh, with this particular view is with ACDC, which is one of the uh, off-the-shelf techniques that we applied. Um, you're not going to be able to read this. And I bet you can't even see that in version 7 there are some components highlighted in green. Those were components added. But what you can see is that the two um, what would you call this, spider webs in between or among these components, they look different from one version to the next. So there have been quite a few changes uh, in the two different versions of, of Android. And then if you zoom in, you can actually see what happened inside of each one of the components. So each one of the components has a bunch of implementation level modules. Green means these modules were added in that version. Red means uh, there used to be modules in version 6 that are now gone from version 7, essentially. Um, 
dependency changes, you can actually look here and isolate various components. And uh, here there are three colors, even though the third one doesn't show up as nicely. Green basically means these dependencies were added between Android 6 and 7. Red means those dependencies existed, but now they've been yanked out. And purple, those are dependencies that changed. Some aspect of them uh, changed between the two different versions. Other things that we wanted to look at was what happened to interfaces. Uh, so this shows uh, kind of a grid view of everything that happens in Android. And blue means unchanged. Green means added to uh, version 7.0. Red means removed from 7.0. And yellow means modified. And then you can zoom into one of those and see which implementation level modules went into uh, each one of those components. So now that we, all, we have all this data, the question becomes, um, to us at least, was uh, at what point does change become decay? So we have two different versions of Chukwa uh, because of a weird numbering scheme they have here. Basically, you have 3.0 and 4.0. They just append a 0 0.3.0 and 4.0 uh, there in front of it. So the question there is, um, did the system decay, or is this just a natural process of changing the system as you're adding new features and so on? Um, it turns out it's both. It, it, uh, systems tend to decay, so we've looked at many of them over their uh, evolution um, over time. And uh, here is an example of Cassandra. Uh, this is 123 different versions of Cassandra, as you'll see. Uh, these are four different uh, Smells, concern overload, link overload, scattered parasitic functionality, and dependency cycle. Dependency cycles actually tend to stay relatively stable. Uh, the other ones kind of go up and to the right. Some of them uh, go uh, crazy. And then the other thing that you see is this jagged behavior, which basically says at one point, engineers just get together and they say, okay, sort of like, a, like an alcoholic. I'm really going to be good from now on. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm going to do my best. We're not, you know, we're going to clean up. And we're gonna, you know, keep it clean. So you see these dips, right? And then they fall off the uh, wagon, and then you know they, <laughs> they uh, you know, continue with the bad, bad uh, habits and so on. The other thing that's interesting is in basically every system that we've looked at, the initial version of the system that's publicly available has smells in it, which means that we call these congenital defects. That means that engineers can't help themselves. They can't, from the get-go, they can't respect what they decided their system should. Uh, uh, look like architecturally. So now that we have all this data, this is uh, uh, Android, for example, what we wanted to do, we basically wanted to detect those smells automatically. So we have 12 of them. Uh, we can detect them automatically. We wanted to correlate them with issues, since we're also siphoning in uh, issue information. And then eventually we wanted to build prediction models. So ideally, what I'd like to be able to do is analyze your system, apply my uh, architecture recovery algorithms, look at the issues over time, figure out what the correlation is, and tell you, look, if you continue this way, three versions from now, you're, gonna, you're likely to have these sets of performance issues, for example. And in fact, we have some interesting results there that um, because of a weird idiosyncrasy with uh, the double-blind review process, uh, I really decided not to tell you about today because the paper is under review. I contacted the conference chairs, and they gave me a non-answer, and I just figured, you know. <laughs> so next time, next year, hopefully I'll be able to tell you about that. But there, there's some interesting results here you're not going to hear about very much. And you can blame <laughs> the, uh, the double-blind craze that's, that's overtaken software engineering conferences. So um, basically, we found a way of mapping issues to, um, to smells. We look at... Um, where the smells reside in your system's code by looking at which code level elements impact architectural elements. Um, and then we also look at which code level elements were changed in order to fix an issue. So the only ones that we look at are those that have been marked as fixed. So we look at it as fixed in this version, and then we go back and figure out when it was actually introduced into the system. And then we figure out which system components actually participated or contributed to that issue and which system components had to, rather to the smell, which system components had to be changed to fix the issue, and then we look at the intersection, essentially. That's kind of what's, what's happening here. So, um, as I already showed you before, uh, this is just a, uh, an example of six different systems, including Hadoop. Um, it basically shows that over the lifespan of these systems, we found this invariably, um, smelly files are more issue prone. So in other words, if you have implementation level files that belong to architectural components that um, are smelly, then they tend to be more issue prone than those that are clean. 
Uh, smelly files also tend to be more change prone. I'm almost done here. I have zero minutes and I'm, I promise I'll <laughs> respect that. Um, we've looked at uh, different versions of Android uh, using multiple different architecture recovery techniques and it turns out that sadly, I was kind of disappointed. I was hoping this wasn't going to happen um, because we all of us do a lot of research on Android. Many of us have Android phones and so on. It turns out the number of smells has grown from six to seven to eight, partly also because Android has gotten uh, more and more complex. Um, Arc is one that can also identify some other smells that the, other, the others can't, and you can actually see also the numbers are steadily uh, going up. So what I'm going to leave you with is the following. Basically, um, issue proneness of files, um, you are about twice as likely to find issues in smelly files than non-smelly files. This is Android data. It's almost uh, exactly the same with some slight variations. It's a, the factory is always around two in all of the other systems that we've looked at. Another thing is um, you're about twice as likely, uh, slightly more than twice as likely to change files that are associated with um, issues if those files contribute to architectural smells. We're not talking code level stuff. You're, you're basically breaking your design. You're paying the price at the implementation level. Finally, um, the issue distribution across files, basically about 14% in the case of Android 7 versus 8, about 14% of all files were smelly but about 44% of all issues were contained within that 14%. So that uh, basically gives a really kind of strong bit of evidence that what you do architecturally to your system really matters. You end up paying the price uh, eventually. How you want to go from this point on is up to you. As they say, it's a free country. But uh, just remember this. All right, so lots of ongoing and future work. As I said, some bit of, uh, of the ongoing work I kind of hinted at in that uh, top bullet, but I'm really not going to tell you about it today. Um, and a bunch of people who helped with this and helped fund this research. Thank you. All right, so maybe one or two questions. So how do you control for size? Because if you say, well, there's more smells in a, in a newer version of, our, of the system, you might go, yeah, but that system twice as big. Right. It's, it's this. So this is on a per file basis, right? So basically, I mean, there, there, are, there are ways of normalizing your results. You're absolutely right. Larger systems get more complex, more smells, blah, blah, blah. Um, what you end up doing is you end up normalizing that based on, on various mm -hmm. factors. You could, you could normalize it based on number of lines of code. You could normalize it based on the number of uh, files. But then there are specific metrics that are on a per file um, uh, Basis. So in this case, it doesn't matter how many files you have. Are those your biggest files? Because you know maybe you have twice as many you know changes to a file because it's twice as big as every other file. So you're, that's just going to happen as a matter of scale. Yeah. Sure. Um, we we have uh, that data as well, and I'm okay. you know I'm happy to talk to you about it. I can I can show you a whole bunch of graphs. Uh, yeah. I think one interesting thing that I don't know if you can measure, but it would be cool if you could is something like developer velocity, because my intuition is with these super complicated architectures, like just the speed at which you can make changes is slower as an individual because you have to worry about all these interconnected parts. So I don't know if you could look at like an individual developer's commit history and see if they're, the commits are getting spaced out more. It's not a perfect measure, but I think it'd be something that'd be really cool to measure if you had a way to do it. Um, that's also something that can be done. Sorry? Also look at time from an issue being open to Absolutely. The, the, the only potential problem there is that uh, with open source systems, uh, developers sometimes participate in multiple projects, sometimes they're not fully committed to a given project. It just it, it varies. Yeah. Those ecosystems are different. But the data is there. And actually, you know, um, if anybody's interested, it would be these are some interesting questions you could you could pursue yourselves. So um, let's Owen, Owen, oh, okay. <laughs> All right, Owen, let's I'd love on. to see a distribution over like which developers made the smells better versus worse, but wouldn't you like to see that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Owen is like, yeah, at the end of the year I have to decide who gets a bigger bonus. So <laughs> All right. All right, so uh, let's thank Nino.